Hi, I'm John Richardson, the director of Chippendale's Off the Cuff. I'm very excited about this newly released documentary. It's been it four years in the making. I started filming in 2014 Magique when Chippendales Las Vegas the had their 35th City anniversary for the men of Chippendales. What followed changed the foundation I was lucky enough to see forever. many of the performers from the 80s in Los Angeles and in New York City. No I interviewed the original the dancers the from New York City, the 80s, 90s, Michael Rapp, Scott Marlowe, Dean Mamelis, myself, and host David Cohen and Dan Peterson. We all played a role in the inception of the highly stylized choreographed show called Welcome to My Fantasy. It's funny because a lot of people back then were saying that the name of the show was Welcome to Your Fantasy. However, it's not. It was Welcome to My Fantasy, originally choreographed by Steve Merritt. In this prelude, you're listening to the narrator, Christina Wong, an amazing woman who's actually in the real estate business. I've been friends with her all these years, and we would hang out from time to time with her sister Joy, and we all became pretty good friends back in the 80s. Now what you're watching here is some archival footage that I compiled and actually had recorded back then. There's very little footage out there from this show in 1987. Now those photos that we see are from many different years that I performed there, starting in 86, when I did a show that was basically a, more of a burlesque show. Before I was ever a Chippendale dancer, I was living in Hawaii for a few months, and I met Dan Peterson there who actually was one of the original hosts. And he was one of the first guys to appear on the Chippendale calendar. Dan was an accomplished photographer and went on to have a company called Skin Deep and was quite successful. And devote. He launched Skin Deep Calendar Company, a gentleman always, soft-spoken, humble, with dreamy, unforgettable looks charm that touched the hearts of millions of women around the world. The look that started it all and forged the path for male entertainers to come. Dan Peterson, six foot two and eyes of blue. We took the job very seriously. You know, women were going crazy. Here in Manhattan, this is 61st and 1st Street at a club called Magique. We've got our ensemble dancers, that's me right there. And this was an entirely choreographed show, so we spent a lot of time during the day at rehearsal. A lot of people don't realize how much work went into these shows. This was literally a muscle-bound Broadway show at its best in the 80s. We were having just as much fun as they were. Every night I gave, you know, 80s at 61st and 1st, you'd find Dangerfields, a popular comedy club, adjacent to that, Adam's Apple for Coffee and Cake. And right across the street from Magic Nightclub, you'd find John and Tony's Pizza, a favorite of the dancers. You could also find John Richardson pounding the pavement, looking for work as a model. Now during the 80s, the sun went down, you'd I was pounding the pavement as an actor, ready to perform. 
and model. So I would leave my days free for go-sees, which was the term for auditions. I remember the rendering time on this montage took quite a while, probably close to 15 hours. And this happens when you use quite a bit of third-party plugins and they're layered on the camera reminding me that it's the canvas within been more than 30 years Adobe After Effects and Chippendales had its 35th anniversary a couple of years ago let me introduce you to the Chippendales this morning on people are talking John Richardson is known as room Service. this is Richard Bay the daytime talk show host for people are talking he was really a great guy when we met him and made it really easy for us to perform. We performed on People Are Talking several times throughout the year, from 86 to about 89. John? John, how about you? What's the sexiest thing a woman's ever said to you? Um, I, I just think when she looks you in the eye, if it's, if it's someone you love and they say, I love you. Even if she, if she just says, I love you, that's the sexiest thing. You shouldn't be known as room service, you should be known as teddy bear. <laughs> That too. Wow, how time flies when you're having fun. So I started out in Los Angeles as a host and a waiter. And then I worked in New York City for about a year before I gave my best shot at dancing, which was I think in 1984, I did the unknown flasher. I was taught by a gentleman named Brian Starcher, who was an entertainer and an actor. He went on to do soaps, a very talented man. And then we, then we got another choreographer about a year later. Steve uh, Merritt was one of the co-creators of the musical Dream Street, which played in Las Vegas from 83 to 1987. Steve was down to earth, very easy to get along with, and he really built the camaraderie between the guys during that first year. Richard Giorla was classically trained. Richard would break dance and he would do the classic windmill. And that was on a cement floor that was highly polished with an acrylic paint. But it was still amazing to see him do it. The ensemble dancers were amazing. They stole the show often. They all had backgrounds in jazz, modern dance, and they were amongst the best in New York City. Most of them came right from Broadway. And the other gentleman we called um, Barishnikov, and his name was Yuram Zabo. What a talent they both were. Yoram Zabo could do these magnificent pirouettes. So welcome to your fantasy. This was a big deal for everybody. And we took it very seriously. Uh, we had Michael Rapp in the forefront. He had a huge ensemble of backup dancers. We had Jonathan Shogun, who did an act called The Cage. And then we can't forget Scott Marlowe. Scott Marlowe was intense. This is somebody you didn't want to piss off. Scott was what we call a gentle giant. As long as you understood the boundaries that he set, uh, you would be in very good company. Talk about big and powerful. This humongous muscle machine and was really a fan favorite. Scott Muller commanded attention. Scott taught us to, you know, really demand and connect with the audience, demand attention. You know, you're out there by yourself, you're under the lights, uh, you've got to connect with that audience and, and, and Scott did it effortlessly.
Scott Marlowe was a Marine. And surprisingly, at six foot three, 240 pounds, could really move his body. He was tenacious and he would hold you to every step in the choreography. We had a lot of fun with Scott. Scott performed to the arrhythmic song, The Missionary Man, and he really gave it all he had. If you notice here, though, we had to change the music because of licensing. And it was actually kind of hard to sync up something that fit his style. Halfway through Scott's act, he came out on a beautiful Harley Davidson motorcycle and he really wowed the crowd. So welcome to your fantasy. This was a big deal. Pretty much had the same feeling as a Broadway show. First of all, I gotta be honest, I know John for a long time, and he did one of the best numbers. He did a waiter number. I did a waiter number, yeah. Top shelf, nobody's done it quite the same ever, and hopefully we'll never do it quite the same again. Now, it's hard to believe, but Andy Warhol was there one night. I remember seeing him. He was taking pictures from the bird's nest, which overlooked the stage. And I think that he actually sold some of those pictures to some of his clients of the original men of Chippendales. I remember Calvin Klein showed up once looking for the next underwear model, and he pretty much auditioned uh, a few of the guys in between the acts. And then I remember I had an audition that following week at his office in New York City. Unfortunately, nothing came out of it, but it was a good networking opportunity. Now, we did quite a bit of talk shows. We did the Sally Jesse Raphael show. We did People Are Talking with Richard Bay. We did Regis Philbin and Phil Donahue. And don't forget, we had to get up very, very early in the morning. So this was a lot of work in addition to our rehearsals, which were weekly, and then our shows, which were seven nights a week, because Wednesday through Saturday, we were in Manhattan. And then during the summer months, we would travel to Virginia Beach from Sunday till the following Tuesday. And it was a nonstop grind. And we did this for a few years. And let me tell you something, it definitely takes its toll on you as a performer. But most of us were really into health and fitness. We really had to pay attention to what we ate, and of course there were parties, but we really had to keep an eye on one another. Here you can see another example of how I used the suspenders with the ensemble dancers and made it look highly stylized. And we have to give credit to Steve Merritt for those moves. He choreographed every second of it. At the time I also worked with a great acting coach, Susan Batson. You may have heard her name. She 
coached quite a few celebrities throughout the 80s, 90s, and she's still currently working as a script supervisor and acting coach for various artists out there. I spent quite a few years pounding the pavement as a model and I worked with agencies you may have heard of called Boss and Storm. I was with William Morris for a little while. They were doing a lot of commercial print back then. So let's see, back in the and I really gave it my best shot. I did okay, made a living, and then moved into the filmmaking world. Now for you filmmakers out there, hold on to your footage. No matter how old it is, I had the original footage for over 30 years, and I was able to turn this into a very interesting story. Also, it took about four years to get the interviews all together of the guys reminiscing about their times at Chippendales. Also keep in mind movies like Jaws and Schindler's List, they took a decade to make, if not more. So some of your projects may take some time, but in the end, just hold on to the dream and hold on to the spirit and the voice of your story and good things will happen. Well, it was a role reversal. You know, you had these burlesque clubs all through the uh, turn of the century, and here is the opposite. Here are men, you know, uh, as, as strippers. David was a good friend of mine in the 80s. We had a lot of weekends together hanging out in Manhattan, Central Park. And a lot of people don't know this, but David was an accomplished and still is an accomplished artist does wonderful renderings of beautiful landscapes and very creative abstracts david also had a lot of confidence and courage within the motocross sport he was involved in that for a couple of years if not longer and i always found that to be pretty interesting considering in the evenings, he was, you know, shaking his tush and entertaining women. And then during the day, he was basically putting his life on the line. And I only live four blocks from there, so I figured, ah, I'll just go over. <laughs> yeah, what? Why not? What was that like? Was it? Well, I met Nick DeNoya, who we all know, and Miss, and. Um, I, no, I wasn't nervous because it was really just more of just. It's not, you know, you're taking your shirt off, and that's it, and that speaks for itself. You know, either you, they like what they see, or they don't. They, I, they didn't hire me on my GPA. I got caught up in the uh, glamour of it, as everybody else did. We would have celebrities show it. up often. Uh, Linda Blair came a few times. I remember seeing her. I remember seeing Brooke Shields. I actually Brooke talked to Brooke was, was for, for about 15 minutes. She was very down to earth and a very special woman. She liked all the guys, and she continued to have an amazing career on Broadway and in television. Sketch something on a napkin for me, you know, because we'd be doing this interview from my mansion in Long Island. If I asked him if he drew something for me and signed it, then the show would be a two-hour show and a choreographed show. This was not some kind of cheap strip joint. You couldn't touch the dancers. You couldn't stuff money into their g-strings. You couldn't fondle them. A the lady would hand uh, her tip to a guy that followed or trailed the, the dancer. He would then take the money, and then the dancer would kiss the lady. I think that Chippendales was the next plateau in the women's movement to free themselves and to gain independence. There was an interstitial period where we would go on tour, uh, but they wanted a group of guys, dancers, at the location on 61st and 1st. So they did put in a, another uh, male review, but these guys uh, kept the, 
the place open, kept um, people interested in that location. I remember uh, one of the dancers, Brian Carpenter, uh, he was an actor actually and a model. He was incredible. The guy was a very good dancer and he kept that whole show together. I was a four-year letterman in college, a uh, captain, two years, and uh, I went up to the Canadian League, tried out with the uh, Toronto Argonauts, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and then I went to the NFL Combines. And uh, at that time I got cut, just started getting into some acting, some modeling, and this and that. One thing led to another, and next thing you know, uh, he says, hey, uh, you, you want to dance? And I said, dance what? Strip. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm a football player. I'm not a stripper, come on. Brian Carpenter had a great career as a sports model. He did a lot of fitness magazines. Vacuuming it in? Vacuuming it in. There you go. Ah, no. yeah, we're good. To be on stage uh, and to be able to have that control and entertain these people, and as an actor, that was. And most recently, Brian was cast in Gotham as Jonathan Wayne. Brian is one of these guys who's very disciplined. He can play a lot of different roles. And he's devoted his life to health and fitness, which keeps him very young and very athletic. Brian happens to be a good friend of mine to this day. We've produced a couple of films together and he's definitely one of the hardest working guys I've met in the entertainment business. What is something embarrassing? We heard all the good things and we saw this great oh reaction to yours. There've gotta be some nights that... Here we go. <laughs> so, you know, what was embarrassing moments? Oh my God, yeah, my G-string fell off. We're not allowed to tuck uh, dollar bills into and the G-string. Say $5. Okay, wow. Well, we're not allowed to do that. And Why? I didn't know that at that time because we just, I just started and I let this $80 bill slip. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 he managed his way through medical school during the day and into adoring women's hearts at night. As one of the club's youngest and brightest stars, he lit up the stage as he toured the world both nationally and internationally. Today, Dean is still known for his award-winning physique and continues his dedication to health and fitness. The interesting thing about Chippendales is the timing of everything. I think it always go goes down to, you know, the timing of something when something you know, finally, uh, finally bursts loose or something like that. But um, you know, the time in the early, uh, the late '70s, early '80s was a time of like women's lib, and uh, at the time there was nothing like uh, the Chippendale show. So when it was developed, and there was a place for women to go to let loose, and that it was okay for them to. Uh, to let loose, uh, it just it just took off, and I don't even think that uh, Steve Banerjee expected it to take off the way it did. But when it did take off like that, uh, the show became more developed. Uh, other people became involved. Tours went out. Brooke Shields would show at the club. The club uh, there's a number one selling calendar. We're on Geraldo Rivera. Um, there's actresses and actors coming to, coming by the club. Place I've seen people that were were getting married because, you know, it was their last hurrah, so to speak. And, uh, and you know, for a while there, I really lost uh, a little faith in relationships and a little, like, faith in women, to be honest with you, because I remember once um, we would always stop at, like, um, a convenience store on the way and uh, on the way home when we, when we leave the different venues. And uh, we stopped at uh, a Wawa, which was a uh, the little 7-Eleven uh, like type store, and there were all these women in there that had gone to the show. So there was this one hot looking girl that went with one of the guys, uh, that saw one of the guys, and uh, they went in back of the Wawa, and uh, he said that this woman like wore her uh, husband's underwear because her husband didn't want her to have sex with anybody. Like he was so afraid that she was gonna have sex with somebody. And she ended up having sex with the guy right, be right behind the Wawa. Uh, uh, <laughs> with her husband's underwear on. 
I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, stuff like that would happen. Dean was an amazing uh, human being, uh, an incredible performer. He had a martial arts background. And uh, Dean was part of the Welcome to Your Fantasy 2, the second show that Steve Merritt choreographed. And I remember Dean coming in as, a, as just a host. Uh, he ended up filling in for somebody one night, and uh, he really showed people that um, he was a, a hidden gem, a hidden talent. But what, it, what happened was, uh, one of the guys, Michael, was shooting the calendar uh, the following day, and um, another guy, that particular night before Michael left to go shoot the calendar, happened to break his leg. And they turned to me and said, you're dancing tomorrow night. You're gonna do a solo act. You're just gonna go out there and just freestyle. And I'm like, freestyle? What are you talking about? Dean went on to be a very accomplished chiropractor in West Palm Beach. He's still a health and fitness advocate and he brings a lot to any business that he's involved in. He's a very special guy. Dean was always a great storyteller. He was very animated in his delivery when telling a story, but when he got on the stage, he was extremely serious, and he definitely wowed the crowd. We go over the Chippendales and um, we have to sneak in the back because men are not allowed at the time in the club. So they sneak us up the fire escape and we go into the VIP section. And inside I see all these guys that are jacked, gorgeous looking, I mean men, that are with women surrounding them. This vibe in the club was electric. I mean, it oozed of sex. And uh, I look through the stained glass windows because you know it was blocked where the men can watch, but you know they weren't allowed on the dance floor. And on the dance floor is Michael Rapp doing the Perfect Man, and they built the Perfect Man. So I was like, oh my God, I have to work here. So at the moment, Nick Denoya, who uh, was the choreographer of the club, uh, sees me and he's like, who who let you in here? How, how old are you? And I said, well, you know, uh, my friend uh, told me to lie and said I was 19, but I'm 16. And he says, uh, you gotta get out of here. You gotta get out of here. So, so my friend starts to walk me out of the club. He goes, you want a job here? And I said, oh my God, I would love a job. And he goes, come back and you can clean the toilets. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? Right? So I never, ever, I let that burn inside of me. And I said, in three years, when I'm 19 years old, because at the time, the drinking age was uh, 19 in New York, I'm gonna go get a job there and I'm gonna tell him to go f himself. Dean came and visited me at my place in Miami and we did the interview there. We had a great time that day. He was also coming off of a men's physique competition. He was in excellent shape, and I decided to take photographs of him on the same day that I interviewed him for this documentary. We got some really good footage. We're still very good friends to this day, and when we get together, it's just like old times. We just make each other laugh and reminisce about the many shows that we did together. The first time since <laughs> I met him, I had my reservations about living with him. Not because he was a bad guy or anything like that, but when I moved in with him, I was very right. independent, and he was very, he's a type A personality. Well, Watches lined right, up, right, right, you right. know, and I move in, I move in with two cats, and I honed in on the closet. He's like, no, oh, that's my closet. I was like, oh, fuck. So he was like, he felt really like, you know, like his space was being taken up, you know, by me. And I felt so unwelcomed. I really like that. That initial uh, first couple of weeks, I was like, fuck, what did I do? Because I was moving back to Miami. I was leaving New York and moving back to Miami. 
and right. I moved in with him and uh, he really that the first few days not the first few weeks he really made me feel uncomfortable and I, I remember writing in my in my journal and it was like when I read that back now years later it was like wow I was miserable I right. really did not right. want to be there I was this close to leaving but now in my defense I'm allergic to cats so at the time, she has two cats that come in that are like 118 years old, and one of them was, both of them had hypothyroidism. And Maria was just full of energy. Even back in the 80s, I can remember her coming in to see the shows, and she's just always had a big smile on her face, always brought a wonderful, wonderful persona to the party. And they have lived happily ever after as husband and wife for many, many years. Dean and Maria are the type of people that will always be in my life. They're always full of inspiration and very positive, and they're a lot of fun to be around. I swear to God, I thought he was going to have our touch. I didn't know what right. was going to come out of his mouth. He didn't say a word. He didn't. He, I said, okay, you know what? Maybe this guy's not bad. Right. <laughs> so I needed to lighten that. up a little bit. And, uh, you know, maybe we needed to, like, you know, keep the cats a little bit at bay. You still wish the cats? You have them still. Actually, we have four cats, and over the years, it was... No, here no, was no, the no. choice. we have children. We don't have cats. That's right, okay. We have felines and children. Exactly. Obviously, Maria loves animals, especially cats. Yeah. And uh, so... I've just grown immune to cats, uh, my allergy, yeah. because it was either uh, be with me and my cats or you can't be with me because my cats can't take care of themselves and I, I'm responsible for taking care of them. So I, I found that awesome that she would, you know, uh, um, put herself before, you know, you know, something that couldn't take care of themselves, whether or not it was a human or any kind of a living being. That's the way, Maria has this natural Buddhist personality and I find that, you know, every, each time that she, she pulls something like that or says something like that, it reminds me of, you know, how I could be a better person. So, uh, 100%. You. Yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, like I have everybody trained in the office. No one is allowed yeah, to we're not kill allowed to kill insects. No bugs, no insect, nothing. I mean, they call me and I take it outside. Right. Spiders, <laughs> doesn't matter, snakes, whatever comes in the office, yeah. you know, Maria removes. Did you ever have anybody uh, take your G-string off or pull your, your, your dick out? Absolutely. Yeah. Little old lady. Uh, once in Atlantic City and once in New York. Both old ladies. Yeah. Yeah. They had to be like... It was simply a role reversal. Women wanted their freedom, and so they had a place to let their hair down where they were just independent and they could go to Chippendales amongst friends, only women, etc. And, you know, we really fell victim to a lot of the stereotypes, meaning we were really there to entertain them and, you know, we were their beefcake for the evening. However, with that comes the groping and misbehaving, etc. And women definitely took advantage of this time of woman's lib. But it was inherent. This is something that needed to happen, uh, especially back in the 80s when women were being manhandled and they were suffering from many stereotypes themselves. Not being able to earn a living, um, you know, I feel as though they were victimized on many levels as mothers and as wives, girlfriends, etc. So women really needed to mark their place in history, and Chippendales played a role in that, where they could just be themselves. It was a pretty interesting time for for women, to say the least. Tape on, and the tape would start running out, and he'd be banging on the door because the tape was gonna run out, and the guy who was in there wouldn't open the door. He wouldn't open the door because right. he was in there fooling around, he was totally naked. And all of a sudden, the music would just go dead in the club. The whole club would just shut down, basically. One misconception was Majik Chippendales was a club where the women only wanted the dancers afterwards. But 
I would go back there. After 10.30, it would become a nightclub again. And it was really enjoyable. The women were on fire, and I would have the time of my life. <laughs> 27 years, a lot of us guys haven't seen each other for, maybe a little less, some phone calls. Some uh, emails with the advent of technology. In 2014, we managed to have a couple of reunions. One was in Greenwich Village, downtown Manhattan. And this was at a place called Bone Lick. Steve Rogers, one of the former managers of Machique, had opened this really down-to-earth grill, barbecue grill, and we all had a great time. There were probably about 20 guys from the 80s who showed up, and it was just nonstop reminiscing. The booze was flowing and the laughter was high. We just had the best evening getting together after not seeing some of the guys for about 15 years. However, since then, we've been able to see each other almost on a yearly basis. We constantly had to, you know, keep each other on point. Um, and of course, you know, we would look up to certain dancers like Michael Rapp that had a few more years um, experience. Uh, I got there in 83 in, in Los Angeles and then worked my way over to New York City in 84. I think Michael was already there about three years. So he knew the ropes. So we would go to Michael and say, hey, what happens if, you know, we lose a prop? Or what happens if uh, somebody steals our G-string? <laughs> and we'd always get a great answer from Michael. Michael Rapp, referred to by many as the perfect man. His Adonis-like features have graced dozens of calendars and posters. Touring the world for almost two decades and appearing on numerous talk shows have helped make his name synonymous as one of the leading male dancers in the world. By the late 90s, the LA native had performed over 5,000 live choreographed shows to millions of adoring fans. Michael, what? I like an aggressive woman. You like an aggressive woman? Yeah. I'm from Los Angeles and I've been living in New York. <laughs> Boston, Massachusetts, Boston. Can you think back to the first night you went out? The very first night? Is it frightening at all? Oh, it was exciting. I couldn't wait to get out there. What does the audience do to you when they're out here and they're screaming? And they're I thought the audience gives you so much energy because, they're, I mean, even on when I'm tired and I go to work with a crowd like this crowd here tonight, there's just no way to be tired and it's just lots of fun. It's the best job I've ever had. I met Michael in Los Angeles in the early 80s and then I worked my way over to Manhattan. Michael was always very open-minded, always had a very steady and relaxed demeanor, and he got it. He got it from the get-go. He knew what was happening. For some of us guys who were really just trying to be actors and models, we didn't really get the Chippendale thing, and especially me. I, it took me about a year to figure out really what was happening here. This was turning into an iconic uh, piece of entertainment and and I was always hopeful that I would take some of the footage that I had and really turn this into our legacy video because there hasn't been another video like this done one that I can think of unfortunately the only documentaries about Chippendales that were made were on the unfortunate murders of Nick DeNoya and the suicide of Steve Banerjee, who was the owner. It always felt very special to me that I could get these guys to do an interview and talk about it, because you gotta remember, we were on stage taking our clothes off, 
It was definitely a spectacle, but it was taboo back in the 80s, meaning if you were a model or an actor, you really couldn't be known as a male dancer. But as time went on, that idea and that negativity was dispelled early on because of the popularity of Chippendales. And these were some of the greatest times of my life. I learned a lot about entertainment, and a lot about filmmaking and storytelling as well. And I learned a lot about dedication and getting the job done, telling your story with facts, an open mind, and a big heart. And to me, that's the essence of being a filmmaker. So I hope you enjoyed this documentary. It was my pleasure to complete it. It was definitely an intolerable suffering, but it was worth it in the end. After performing the choreographed numbers, each individual guy would go out into the audience and the woman would wave dollar bills, sometimes 20s, sometime C notes. And this was interesting because we got a chance to get up close and personal. They would take their money and either hand it to a host or try to sneak it into our G-string. And then we would kiss them on the cheek. And in some cases, you would kiss them on the lips. So that wasn't too often, but most kisses were given on the cheek. And it was fun. It was innocent. And that was the fun part about performing, when you could basically just let it all hang out and have these women really just admire the human form. Now in 2019, there's a lot of compassion for the Me Too movement and women's rights, etc. And one could only imagine what we were going through back then. I mean, most men are put in a box and we're not supposed to cry and we're not supposed to feel anything really, especially back in the 80s. However, we were taken advantage of on many levels. Women just expected us to allow them to pretty much uh, be their beefcake, be their private dancer for this one evening. There was some embarrassing moments. There were some times where the women crossed the line. We were supposed to take it all in jest. But believe me, we felt the humility on a regular basis and we felt a bit victimized. But men are not expected to complain about their feelings, especially when it's in the category of sexual prowess, et cetera, et cetera. The brotherhood of Chip and Nails, they'd have to go through it. The final curtain call, uh, that was, it was like, it was like leaving a sorority. It was like leaving your family. Now, we did quite a bit of talk shows. We did the Sally Jesse Raphael show. We did People Are Talking with Richard Bay. We did Regis Philbin and Phil Donahue. And don't forget, we had to get up very, very early in the morning, 4.30, 5 o'clock, to be on set for 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. So this was a lot of work in addition to our rehearsals, which were weekly. The men of Chippendales also did quite a bit of charity work. We were very proud of that. I can remember working for PETA and working for the American Cancer Association, meaning volunteering and trying to raise money, whether it was through a telethon or some sort of live fundraising event. So we were a spectacle, but we did make a difference in people's lives on many, many levels, especially monetarily. Your pants down, so you were more recognizable. <laughs> we learned to handle ourselves in big groups. We learned how to 
be interviewed because we were constantly, you know, uh, being interviewed and people were, uh, were, you know, we were on TV. And we learned how to, we grew up uh, fast and I'm lost. <laughs> I have a balanced schedule. <laughs> We were studying modern dance, jazz, all that Bob Fosse stuff. Uh, great for your health, great for your body, great for your mind, and, and you looked like you knew what you were doing out there once you got on stage, that's for sure. Here goes the nose again. <laughs> all right, I gotta take a break. Excuse me. As I view these photos, I realize going down memory lane can be quite painful. We lost so many, so many friends and incredible Chippendale brothers. It's pretty sad. The Chippendales men touch so many people in positive ways. It's good to reflect for a moment and know that this time that we spent there in Manhattan on 61st and 1st really made a difference in people's lives. And I think we all felt pretty proud of that. Well, in closing, I really enjoyed creating this documentary and going down memory lane and sharing with you a lot of these intimate personal stories that happened behind the scenes. And I hope that you take a close look at it and realize that we were a very professional team of actors, singers and dancers that made something special on the east side of Manhattan, New York City, 61st and 1st. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It was a pleasure making this documentary.
It was 1982 and Chippendales had already made its mark in Los Angeles. Magique the Nightclub opened its doors in New York City to an all-female audience. What followed changed the foundation of the male review forever. No one could have ever predicted the success of the show that would dominate the 80s, 90s, and the millennium. What you're about to experience is a behind the scenes look, up close and personal, told by the men that were there. Determined to succeed, the famous and sometimes infamous performers of the 80s exposed the most intimate experiences as they toured from east to west coast. Driven by their performance, sexuality, and the women they loved from around the world. Each heart-stopping performance pushed the envelope of sexual expression for women finding their independence through the joy of being free with the men of Chippendales. caught up in the uh, glamour of it, as everybody else did. Now, looking back on it, it was the decade of, of excess. It was, it was really an incredible time for everyone. A chance for women to really let their hair down. We were stripping our souls. You get caught up in, you know, the drugs, and rock and roll, fun, the women. Every night I gave, you know, 110%. It was one of the most exciting times of my life. This was not some kind of cheap strip joint. We performed, we entertained. We were having just as much fun as they were. This was a choreographed show, so we gave it everything we had. We didn't play games. Vegas stole it from us. What happens here stays here. This vibe in the club was electric. I mean, it oozed of sex. You can do Woodstock every 10 years, but it ain't gonna be 1969 Woodstock, and there'll never, never be another Beatles, and there'll never be another Chip and Nails, the original that we were. We were the original guys. Do women want to mother you? Uh, <laughs> not really, but you know, we do get quite a bit of propositions. How do you handle that? Oh, very carefully. 